Hello and Happy New Year, guys. May this be a fantastic year for everyone. Welcome to Fuel the Pedal podcast, and we are here on our first episode of 2020. This year, I will remain as your faithful host, Gabriel Martins, and so let's kick off this year in the best way possible, shall we? And we are starting our crusade talking with one of the biggest names in sports nutrition who has been giving an outstanding contribution to the research we have available so far on many sports nutrition and sports science related topics. I'm talking about Dr. Graham Close from Liverpool John Moose University and he was kind enough to join us here on the podcast to talk about injury prevention and treatment in the particular case of cycling, a topic that I will later provide an introduction to justify why I believe this could be an interesting topic to bring here to the podcast. About Dr. Graham Close, he's the expert nutrition consultant to England Rugby and nutrition consultant to Everton Football Club and Nottingham Forest. Graham is also the head of performance nutrition to the European Tour Golf and the Lawn Tennis Association and several world-class athletes. Interestingly, he is also a former professional rugby league player and he is now a professor of human physiology at Liverpool John Moores University alongside with Dr. James Morton, who has been here on the podcast as well. Graham is the program leader for the Master in Sports Nutrition in Liverpool John Morris University. Graham has published over 100 review articles and spoken at uh, 50 conferences around the globe. As well as working with elite athletes, Graham delivers seminars and workshops to corporate clients, translating lessons from the sporting world to the office floor to improve health, wellness and productivity. And what a great way to start the year this is. I really believe this topic deserves much attention since injury prevention is getting much more attention in the past few years in some sports, particularly team sports. And cycling teams could also benefit from such strategies in order to prevent up until a certain point, of course, because crashes are an inevitable part of uh, cycling. But there may be actually some details to master, both on the prevention and on the treatment side, mainly in what can we do in periods of mobilization to promote a much swifter recovery. Many are also the supplements that claim to help in this particular period, whether it is in tissue regeneration, bone formation and reduction in the inflammatory process. And so we will be tackling this issue as well with Dr. Graham Close up next on Fuel the Pedal podcast. Hi, Graham. Welcome to Fuel the Pedal podcast. It's an absolute honor to have you here on the show with us. Ah, Thanks for the invitation. Uh, Looking forward to it. Graham, thanks again for taking the time to do this and to be willing to to share your expertise on this particular topic. I think it's now fair to say that Liverpool John Mercer University is the university with the biggest guest contributions to this podcast. Uh, so we had we had Jamie Pugh, had James Morton, uh, Mark Evans and Sam Impey, who I think they completed part of their academic career there too. So it's five out of 17 guests so far, which is a pretty big contribution, don't you think? That's pretty impressive. Um, yeah, well, myself and James Morton, about six years ago now, we, we had this vision of trying to make Liverpool John Moores University the, the centre for sport nutrition research. So maybe that's beginning to take some fruition. It surely has, and it would seem that your vision and James's came to be. So I believe some congratulations are in order, and a big thanks to LGMU for its science contributions in the area of sports science and performance nutrition-related research. And, of course, to the contributions for this podcast as well. So, Grant, could you present yourselves to the listeners? Yes, so I'm, um, as you said, I'm a, a professor at Liverpool John Moores University, where, where, along with my colleague James Morton, who you've mentioned, who's been on this show uh, we set up a master's degree in sport nutrition around about five years ago. And, and as well as being a professor in sport nutrition, you know, I'm a former rugby league player, you know, back in the mid 90s. And I'm currently the uh, nutrition consultant to the England rugby team. But I also work in other sports, such as I'm, I'm the head of nutrition for European Tour Golf. Uh, and, and I consult to several elite sports teams, such as Premier League football clubs. 
Terrific. So, Graham, I would start this episode by making the same question I've asked Trent Stellingworth on episode 17. And this is somewhat related to your recent publication with Dr. James Morton on the paper to podium research. So, just like Trent Stellingworth, Louis Burke, James himself, just to cite a few, you are an example of a researcher who is both on the lab and on the field as well. How important do you believe this is when designing and producing scientific research? Uh, you know, it's, that's a really good question. And in my opinion, it, it's crucial. Uh, and it's crucial for multiple reasons. The obvious one is it allows us to answer the questions that the elite world wants answering. You know, if, if you jump on PubMed, there's literally hundreds of thousands of research papers, and many thousand in sport. But how many of them questions are directly uh, answering what the elite world wants answering, I, I would question. Um, often research is done for the sake of it or even um, just to fulfill university commitments. So I think having that foot in the elite world allows us to answer the questions. The other thing that it does is it gives us insights to what the elite world are doing. And often what we can then do is bring them questions back to the, not even questions, them, them answers often back to a laboratory. You know, there's many examples of things that we do know in sport nutrition. Well, when I was being taught it many years ago, we was told it, it was nonsense. So, for example, we were told we didn't need more than a regular amount of protein or that every training session needs to be really high carbohydrate fueled. And now what we're beginning to understand is what the elite world have been doing for years actually has academic um, credibility. So, so I think it's really important to to engage in the world uh, and the final reason it's important is i think it's so exciting for our for the students to actually see what is going on so it, it's all right explaining what's in the papers and the textbooks but then when you can you know bring to life that with your experiences so you know i'm just back from the, the rugby world cup in japan um and already i've, I've given some lectures to my students about how we tried to take the nutrition research that we've done at John Moores and showed examples of how we help that, you know, use that, sorry, in the Rugby World Cup. Great insights, Graham. I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, it's great to see uh, so much of the modern research to be born from this uh, merging of sports science with the, the field environment itself. And just the fact that we can bring real questions from the athletes and coaches to the lab. And even sometimes we can actually confirm what they had been doing for years. It's really a, a great match. And uh, let's hope we can keep obtaining uh, this type of data from the athletic world, not only in cycling, but in other sports as well when it comes to nutrition. So on this talk with Dr. Graham Close, uh, we'll be focusing on prevention and treatment of muscle and bone injuries and going through the latest evidence-based knowledge available on how nutrition can be of any help. And the basis of our talk today is a recent review by Dr. Graham Close himself along with Craig Sale, Keith Barr and Stefan Bermont, I hope I got that right, uh, entitled Nutrition for the Prevention and Treatment of Injuries in Track and Field Athletes. And although this paper focuses on track and field athletes, I believe many of the main factors listed may also apply to cyclists as well. And if not, I'm sure Dr. Graham Close will tell us uh, if the research does not apply to cycling. So, uh, Graham, I would start by asking you, why did you and the rest of the co-authors felt the need to elaborate this review in the first place? I can give you the the honest answer, or I can give you the answer that I probably need to uh, put out in in public. Um, the, the honest answer is we were invited. Um, there was a special edition of the of the journal uh, specifically to do with track and field, uh, and we was inv we were invited to put, or I was invited to put a team together to deal with this particular topic of the prevention and treatment of, of injuries. So you're exactly right how you introduce this in as much as, you know, we were invited to write this for a special edition on track and field athletes. However, mm -hmm. what we discuss, you know, could easily just be termed nutrition for the prevention and treatment of injuries in athletes. I don't think there's anything that's wholly exclusive to, to track and field. And the second reason we were, we were asked to do it is that, There's been a lot of advances over the last five or six years on what we're doing to try and help and prevent injuries. So it was probably really timely, particularly with some of the work from Keith Barr, who wrote the section on tendon and, and ligament injuries. You know, the world needed an up-to-date review on this topic. 
Perfect, Graham. So now that we know how this research came to be, allow me just to give a, a, a brief introduction for the listeners, just to give my, my thoughts on why I believe this may be an important topic to have here on, on the podcast. So whether it is due to collision with other riders uh, slipping during descents or crashing during a, a mass sprint, crashes are nothing new in the world of cycling. But road cycling in particular may be one of the most dangerous endeavors of all cycling modalities, which uh, could lead into immobilization and many weeks of carefully planned recovery. And according to data from Pro Cycling Stats, as for 2019, there were approximately 200 injured cyclists. Around uh, 70 of these are due to broken collarbone as a result of crashing. The most serious injury so far, I think, is unquestionably uh, Chris Frooms, uh, who um, sustained multiple injuries including a fractured right femur, a fractured elbow and a fractured rib and who fortunately had a very favorable road to recovery and is planned to be back this next season. But not only bone fractures make up for all the crashing related injuries in cycling, soft tissue injuries such as laceration, muscle contusion and even ligament tendon injuries also play an important contribution to cycling injuries that are capable of incapacitating cyclists for weeks which requires a meticulous recovery process where nutrition may actually offer some support so graham i think one of uh, one way we could possibly start tackling this topic is by trying to describe what happens right after an injury and what stages or aspects of recovery might be positively affected by certain nutrition strategies so we can tackle each one of them throughout this episode okay yeah so you know there's various ways there's no real one way to to answer that question but what we can do is we can think about it in a few simple stages so so the initial stage is probably the uh, immobilization so you know often what happens when when somebody gets injured uh, activity levels reduce whether that is uh, completely cease or whether we just reduce the amount we're doing so we need to think about the immobilization we also need to think about the initial phase being uh, from a, an inflammation perspective so often, depending on the type of injury, there's an inflammatory response. We will then move into uh, a regeneration phase where, where things start to heal uh, and the body's putting things back together. And then finally, we're probably looking into a, a reintegration where we're, we're trying to then gradually increase our training intensities and, and get back to the activities that we were doing prior to the injury uh, itself. Perfect, Graham. So if you agree, I'd like to dedicate this first part to the estimation of energy expenditure. And this is one of the things that really caught my attention in your paper and that I think it might be the first step in helping athletes recover. Uh, as you've mentioned in your paper, there are some factors to be taken into consideration, uh, such as the use of crutches or if the athletes are exercising their non-injured limbs, for example. What are the factors need to be taken into account when aiming to estimate energy expenditure in athletes who are in such conditions? Yeah, so, so the first thing that we often do um, when somebody gets injured, uh, there's an initial concern about un unnecessary gain of body fat. Uh, and over the last few years, and, and this is one example of where you say about what have you learned from working in elite sport that maybe isn't in the literature. This is one example where, you know, I, I see people completely stress early on about not overeating uh, and reduce the calorie intake probably to the point where they overreduce it. Because what we know, uh, and we've got some data in, in football players and, and rugby players about this, is that actually the drop in energy expenditure when they're injured often isn't as dramatic as what one would think. Uh, and, and that could be for multiple factors, such as what you were saying, that, that you know metabolism might increase slightly to um, so the resting metabolic rate can increase to try and deal with the, with the injury. As you say, movement or locomotion becomes uh, more difficult, especially using crutches. So the energy cost of, of locomotion increases. And often some of the rehabilitation that people are doing, what we're now doing a lot in, in elite sport is early mobilization. So rather than being a complete rest when somebody's injured, we often try and get them doing something. So if someone's broke a collarbone, for example, they may actually still be on the bike and, you know, and trying to maintain some degree of exercise. Uh, and my concern a few years ago was that the, the biggest factor that we, we need to get right probably at this stage of an injury is enough fuel to actually allow the recovery process to go on. Uh, and one of the biggest risk factors for either injury or poor recovery would be a low energy availability. 
So actually, I, I think sometimes if we had to go either side of the line, if you imagine an, an imaginary line here on one side, we slightly over consume calories uh, and the risk is a slight gain in body fat and the other side we slightly under consume because we're worried about putting on body fat. The risk uh, is inadequate recovery. I'm always going to sit on that north side of the line. I'm always going to, if anything, slightly overfuel. And, and I can worry about a, a one to two pound increase in body fat later down the line. But the last thing I want is insufficient energy that you don't get um, a, a full healing of that fracture, for example. That makes the perfect transition for uh, one of the, the next questions I had for you about this, which is how low... Uh, can we go? And this may be the case that for some reason we could underestimate the energy requirements or that the athlete is stressed about it and wants to just reduce because he knows he is not moving. So uh, is there a minimum of energy availability in, uh, expressed in number of kilocalories per, per kilo of lean body mass as, as stated in your paper that we should try to avoid and look out for in this particular situation? Uh, do you know, I, I don't think there is anything... That is completely hypothesis driven and laboratory tested. Um, what we do know is that, you, you, you know, and what we may come on to this later in other topics, if we can't cut the, we certainly don't want to cut, cut the protein intake. If anything, we're going to increase our protein intake. Mm -hmm. Again, we were, you know, we probably wouldn't want to cut the fat intake as well for other reasons that we'll talk about uh, later. So now we're, we're down to some, um, looking at some of the carbohydrate intakes. I certainly, if anything, wouldn't want to be in, a, in a, um, a calorie intake where we're seeing any drop in body weight because at that point, the chances are we're not fueling that recovery uh, right. I think, if anything, it's going to be a little bit of a trial and, uh, and error and actually it's going to be different for each individual. Uh, and and you, you'd probably want to be somewhere near the, the, uh, the Anne Luke's um, literature on what would be a, an energy availability from ensuring that no one has got a relative energy deficient in sport. So we're probably looking quite high, really, during this phase. Okay, just for the listeners to get this correctly, the best rationale here, in your view, would probably require some trial and error when estimating energy requirements and aim to provide the adequate amount of micronutrients to support uh, the recovery process, which we'll get into in a moment, and eventually minimize uh, lean body mass loss. Is this accurate? I think I, I think that's probably the best advice at the moment and work with a nutritionist um, at this stage to really try and um, make sure that we're not overcutting and we're actually consuming not only the right amount of calories but the ma right macro and micronutrients to, to fill, facilitate that recovery. Perfect, Graham. So you've mentioned protein and this might just be the most attractive and probably that one macronutrient that everyone associates with recovery support. Um, so what is the role of protein in helping with the recovery process and even during periods of immobilization? What advantages are there in consuming protein and how much should athletes, in this case cyclists who are immobilized, should aim for in this particular period? Yeah, well, you know... What we, what we know is one of the um, worries in this stage would be to a, a loss of lean mass. Uh, and there's been some nice case studies now, again, not in cycling, but in other sports whereby when people have cut calories across the board, including protein, uh, that has been at the expense of losing a reasonable amount of, of lean muscle mass. So if anything, what we probably need to do is increase dietary protein up to maybe around 2.3 grams per kilogram body mass. Uh, which would be in, in line with like the Sam Mettler research in 2010, um, which wasn't necessarily on injury, but was, was around maintenance of lean mass during a hypercaloric uh, type diet. So I would want to probably incre increase the protein if you wasn't already on 2.3 grams per kg and make sure this is coming regularly um, throughout the day. Uh, and it's not just from a, from a muscle perspective, but also from an immune uh, perspective. You know, the important role that protein has in the immune function, um, you, you would probably want to make sure that there certainly wasn't any any deficiencies here. Uh, and this can sometimes happen because people may think that, no, we stop training, we might actually don't need to um, get the, the regular protein intake or we don't make as much effort, for example, to, to get it at, at breakfast. Or some people may be getting a, a lot of the protein intake in shakes that they're taking post-workouts. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then actually by not having them, if it's not replaced with other dietary proteins, they can end up uh, dropping the protein intake. So it, it certainly is something we would focus heavily upon in this in this time period. Graham, and do you believe that this high and consistent protein intake plays an important role throughout the whole period of recovery and immobilization? Or there is a specific period, like the first two weeks, for example, in which more attention needs to be put on making sure an athlete uh, is consuming an adequate amount of protein? Uh, well, you know, there's, there's been some nice research um, showing that during uh, immobilization, uh, you know, you actually increasing. Um, protein intake can prevent the the, uh, the loss of lean mass. So if early on in the injury there is immobilization uh, going on, you know, and, you know, let's say in the case of, you know, a broken collarbone, but some people are going to have, you know, two or three weeks of doing very little, then, you know, this does become a particularly crucial time. Sure, and perhaps taking into account what you've just mentioned, that an immobilization period can last from a few weeks, but it could also last a lot more, which might also increase the chances of uh, strength losses in cyclists. Do you believe protein plays an important role here as well? And perhaps we could make a, a bridge here to mention the possible role of creatine supplementation for this purpose as well. Yeah, so you know, one thing we know, you know, before we move off the of protein, is that in, you know, when in an injured or in an or in an immobilized limb, um, the body can go through what has been termed anabolic resistance, so where you don't get the same anabolic response to having a set amount of protein. So if somebody in, in a normal state was to get a maximum anabolic re response to twenty grams of protein. Uh, but the research suggests that it may be significantly higher to get the maximum um, anabolic response uh, in an immobilized limb. And, yeah, but things like creatine have been shown to um, reduce the loss of muscle mass during the injury. Uh, and so as things like um, omega-3s. You know, there's been some nice research uh, recently by Chris McGlory, um, who's a former GMU uh, student who then went out to uh, McMaster University with with Stu Phillips and some uh, real-world leaders in this field. Uh, and Chris has shown, uh, you know, quite high dose. I think it was around about five grams a day of fish oils, which was given, if I remember right, three and a half grams of, uh, of EPA, was able to actually um, prevent some of the loss of lean mass when people were going through disuse muscle atrophy. Um, now, what was interesting about that or what's relevant about that study was that the, this high-dose fish oil started, I think it was two weeks before the injury, and then was maintained during it. Uh, now, obviously, we can never preempt uh, an injury. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if this also was effective if you started taking it as soon as the injury happened. But there's certainly some good evidence around creatine and um, omega-3 fish oils when it comes to trying to prevent that disuse atrophy. Hmm. And since creatine is not a popular supplement uh, amongst cyclists, I would say probably due to some fear of weight gain due to liquid retention, do you believe that there is any logic behind this possible weight gain when creatine is used on an immobilization phase? Personally, no, because that you know that can you know I, I understand that some cyclists are worried about that um, because of you know power to weight ratio on the bike. Um, I, I guess it depends on priorities and you know, how quickly they're going to back on the bike, you know, it, it soon um, drops when people come off, off the creatine. Um, if the preservation of lean mass isn't absolutely crucial, well, then that could be taken into consideration. But you may focus on the other strat strategies like the fish oil and the higher protein intake. Okay, so... Just to, to sum up what we've been discussing so far. So we have an increased anabolic resistance in this particular period. And we one of the things that we should aim for first is to at least maintain the protein intake if it wasn't already high, at least under these 2.3 grams per kilo per day. And uh, try to, as much as possible, to have a good communication with the, with the athlete and try to at least counter this tendency for having a chronic low intake or low energy availability that might occur. Um, this would be probably the main things to, to tackle, right? That's, yeah, correct. Good summary. So um, you've mentioned also a uh, carbohydrate intake. And given that athletic activities are reduced, if not stopped completely, 
it seems appropriate that to suggest that carbohydrate intake should also follow this pattern and uh, be reduced as well. How do you believe that we should periodize this uh, carbohydrate intake? Or the question here would be, how low should we go when uh, um, taking into account this uh, recovery process and also taking into consideration the energy cost of he the healing process itself that may uh, actually require, I don't know, uh, some carbohydrate as well? Yeah, you know, certainly I wouldn't want to go um, uh, on onto like a zero carbohydrate diet, and I, and I probably wouldn't want to go too low. As we said at the beginning, you know, if we think about the calories that we would need to get the protein right, you know, around about you know two point three grams per kilogram, and then fat intake, if we was to say that would be around about the one gram per kilogram mark, um, the carbohydrate should make up the rest. Now. You know, depending on the weight and the activity of the athlete, we're probably looking somewhere in the region of two to four grams per kilogram body mass. So we're certainly not up at the higher, maybe, you know, six to 10 grams that we may be doing when, whilst doing the hard rides. Um, but we're, we're also not at the very low end or the ketogenic style end where we're getting under 50 grams of carbohydrate. So it, it depends a little bit on the, the activity um level but i would use the calories remaining after you've accounted for the fat and the protein to work out roughly what the carbohydrate needs would be at this stage yeah, you know that, that's how we uh, you know we tend to do it now you know i know some people may think but you know there's other ways uh, and sure there are you know everyone has their own way of doing things and, uh, and, and opinions but, but, but the reason i tend to do it that way is because of we said the important role of protein in this stage uh, the important role of um, the, the fats, the essential fatty acids and everything like that, um, then um, then you've got to try and get yourself uh, back in, you know, back in um, a slightly positive energy balance to allow, make sure that we've got sufficient work for recovery. And, you know, the last thing I would want someone to do is cut the cal cows so low that we um, hinder the potential to recover. Graham, I wasn't planning on getting into the role of essential fatty acids and just dietary fats uh, in all this process before getting into the um, the issue of omega-3 and fish oil supplementation. But since you've mentioned yeah. it, uh, do you believe there is any risk or any essential role of uh, um, dietary uh, fats uh, in this process when going below uh, one gram per kilo, as you've mentioned? As far as I know, that research isn't there. You know, my gut feeling would be yes. Um, uh, you know, and my gut feeling would be that um, historically we've been cut, we've become a little bit too con um, concerned about fat because of the, the term fat. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if we called them essential fatty acids, people wouldn't be as fatophobic as what what people often are. Um, yeah, you know, particularly from, you know, the, the polyunsaturated fatty acids that we were talking about, the omega-3, 6s, et cetera, um, you know, the, the risk would be of if we became too weight conscious at this stage and, and dropped that down really low, um, but not only from the essential fatty acids, but actually from the actual calorie perspective as well. You know, people may drop the carbs low because – they don't feel they need that energy because we're not training. If it was then also to drop the fat slow, we then have got the you know a huge chance of having low energy availability, and we're massively increasing our chance of delo uh, delaying that recovery process. Yep. Thanks for clearing that up, Graham. So transitioning now to one of the things that I love to read the most on your paper was the part dedicated to fish oil supplementation and its possible role in this process, especially since we often see a lot of fuss about it uh, and perhaps too much faith on fish oil and omega-3 uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids without knowing just how much is needed, just for how long do we need to take it and whether if this can actually positively impact in some some way recovery and inflammation so Graham could you please shed some light with us uh, on this topic because I think that in everything in life quantification is essential particularly in cases like this where some strategy might appear fancy and attractive but the evidence just might not keep up with these expectations or perhaps I'm wrong so 
I would ask you, what is the possible role that omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil can have in this particular case and just how much should we aim for to obtain any effect and for how long should this supplementation be taken or maintained for any changes to be observed? Yeah, you know, it's, again, it's another good question. And despite a lot of research and, uh, you know, a lot of people using fish oil, as you say, we probably are still quite in its infancy when it comes to understanding it from a sport perspective. You know, if, if you think about the essential role um, of these uh, omega-3s on cell membranes, you know, a really important constituent of cell membranes, if you can change, if it changes a cell membrane, then in principle, almost as an unlimited amount of effects that it could be having. And I think we're only just beginning to understand the, the wide variety of roles that it can have from a, a cell membrane perspective. The, the, world, the way that it's been discussed, you know, a little bit more than that is from a, an inflammatory perspective uh, and showing the, the particularly the omega-3, the effects it has as a, from an anti-inflammatory perspective but, and also the, the role that it's got in cardiovascular disease. Now, my reading is that there's still a lot of correlative um, research on omega-3s and not a lot of uh, cause and effect research. Um, and that's why the stuff from Chris McGlory became particularly interested when, for me, this is some of the strongest evidence to show a real benefit. Um, you're exactly right when you was talking about the dose. You know, I, I see a lot of fish oil supplements where you're only getting maybe two or 300 milligrams of EPA uh, and DHA. Bear in mind, they appear to be the two uh, key elements within the fish oil, EPA and DHA, where some of the cheaper fish oils tend to be high in ALA, um, alpha linoleic acid. So we need to make sure that the composition of the fish oil is right and also the dose of it. Now, work from, um, again, I think it was from Chris McGlory and his, his team, was suggesting that you know it probably needs to be north of, of three grams to really see any real measurable uh, effects there. Um, and, and like I say, in, in the study where they showed an effect on uh, preventing disuse atrophy, that was up at five grams. Now, five grams of a high quality fish oil, one, is very expensive if you used to take that daily. And, and two, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see some long term um, studies just to make sure there's no adverse effects of going so high for, for, that, for a long period of time. But certainly from a financial perspective, I certainly don't think I could be afford to be taking five grams of fish oil per day. Yes, that's exactly my point and my my issue with the omega three is, uh, as stated in your paper, you have you say that five grams a day um, taken for at least for two weeks, and this thinking of the the cost benefit factor of this uh, probably. Uh, uh, makes makes us think about if is this worth it? Is this really worth it? And along with the fact that we don't have, as you said, uh, long term studies and not many studies on athletes, is what makes me question the why this supplement should be even considered. Yeah, you know, yeah, I agree completely. The, the amount of times I go into a sports team and I'll see things like seven or eight supplements being taken every day. And there may be some fish oil, some creatine, some betralanine, uh, vitamin D, whatever. But there's some probiotics. And then when you look at what they're taking, every single one of them is an ineffective dose. And I often think you would be far better to pick the one that is most specific to what you need and actually take it properly. So I see a lot of people taking betralanine as, as a buffer. Uh, I'm going off topic here, but just bear with me. And, you know, they may have like a gram a day of this betralanine because we don't want to get the skin tingling. Well, we know that they probably need more like six grams a day and take them evenly throughout the day. Or they may be taking 400 international units of vitamin D, which is nowhere near to correct the deficiency. Or in this case, they may be taking three or 400 milligrams of fish oil. We're actually, you know, as far as I can see, there's no real evidence but at that level, we're going to do anything uh, to, to blood concentrations. So you're right. It may be one of these where you think about, you know, what do we need? And you do it properly for a short period of time when it's needed. So an injured athlete, you might use fish oil specifically at this time point for like a four week period and take your five grams a day and do it properly um, rather than taking half a gram throughout the entire year. 
Sure, I couldn't agree more, Graham. And I think this gives us a good transition to talk about the inflammation process that might occur during recovery. And I believe this is an old debate on whether we should reduce inflammation or not. So uh, taking into consideration that inflammation might be a necessary step in the healing process and it's even an important part of training adaptations, do we really want to decrease inflammation in this particular context of bone and muscle injury? or do we want some inflammation to actually help with the recovery process? How do we set the limit here? <laughs> there you go. Now you've asked me a question, but I think you could get 10 world leaders on inflammation in the same room and they would walk out fighting. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I think, you're, well, look, let's go back to first principles. You're right. There's a reason that we have an inflammatory response and, and that is to help. Um, and I think for too many years as sports scientists, we have made big mistakes by looking at what the body does in certain situations and trying to stop it. So a good example could be from the world of antioxidants. For, for years, whenever there was a, an oxidative response, we gave high-dose antioxidants such as vitamin C, vitamin E, um, and showed we could change our oxidant-antioxidant ratio. And then what we then begin aware of is we're probably blocking adaptations because a lot of adaptations to exercise – seem to need a change in the redox state. Similar, there's been research like that on anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, whereby, you know, giving the, the anti-inflams post-exercise when there hasn't been an injury seems to attenuate some of the responses to exercise. When there has been an, a, an injury and we do get inflammation, um, there does appear to be a good case that actually controlling that inflammation might be a good thing. And this is where I'd pass on to more of my, my medical colleagues. You know, I certainly wouldn't be overruling a doctor if, if he was prescribing, you know, anti-inflammatories at this point. Um, I, I do think that by giving foods that have got, you know, reported to help from, from that perspective, you know, I don't, I think all that is going to be doing is supporting the body rather than giving drugs, which can then be working against it. So it was to increase the omega-3s or was to give the type of like vitamin C and the, the foods that are, are there to help uh, the inflammatory response. I think we're probably doing a, a good thing and making sure that we haven't got any micronutrient deficiencies at that stage. Um, but, you know, whether we need to start flow, uh, throwing in, you know, some of the really start strong non-steroidals, I'll leave that one for the medics. Sure. So could we assume that the, the inflammatory properties that we obtain from foods or from particular dietary supplements such as uh, fish oil would never be comparable to those of anti-inflammatory drugs that would be responsible to have uh, the biggest impact in reducing the inflammatory response possibly? up to an undesirable level and by taking these foods uh, we do get some much smaller uh, benefit in inflammation reduction but not enough uh, to reduce uh, inflammation at the level that we are uh, talking about would this be accurate yeah i think that's a very good way to put yeah to, to summarize it perfect graham so regarding bone injuries, and it seems almost unrealistic to assume that nutrition can help prevent bone injuries in a cyclist who crashes violently and fractures the collarbone. So the only thing that comes to my mind uh, is the possible effect of chronic low energy availability or red S uh, can have yeah. in a particular moment of a peak performance week on bone formation after a crash. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Graham, is this uh, a possible scenario that might happen? Uh, what other factors might condition the recovery from bone injuries? Without doubt, um, you know, the way to look at this section is exactly what you're saying is, you know, we're not going to be able to give a bit of extra protein and suddenly if you fall off a bike, you're less likely to fracture mm. a collarbone. However, what we do know uh, and, you know, there's work by Anne Lukes and people like that has shown that bone formation uh, does become reduced uh, even a modest low energy availability such as like 30 kilocals per kilogram lean body mass and actually when you get down to severe ones like 10 kilocals per kilogram lean body mass but then you actually get quite a um, quite a big negative effect on bone both in terms of uh, reducing bone formation and also increasing uh, bone resorption so uh, and, and them type of values aren't uncommon in, in cyclists, you know, getting certainly under 30 would be common. And actually, it wouldn't be uncommon to see some energy availabilities down at 10. 
um, kilocals per kilogram. So yeah, the energy availability is, is one of these issues that I still don't think the world of elite sport has fully worked out how to deal with because you know with the changes in our the way we're thinking from power to body mass ratios and people striving for low weights on a bike well, it's, it, it's unquestionable that at times um, riders will have low energy availability um, you know I, the way I'm thinking about it at the moment is this probably should be periodized throughout the year so I, you know I know you, you spoke with um, Trent Stellingworth about you know this and um, you know, some of the work that he's done in, in athletes showing how to periodize low energy availability could be the answer. But there's other um, nutritional factors as well, such as vitamin D and calcium, whereby if we don't get them right long term, we can have negative effects on bone health. So in terms of the prevention of, of fractures or, you know, bone problems, uh, I, I guess it's more looking at the long term diet and, and what people are doing to make sure that if they do fall off the bike, we're falling off with solid strong bones rather than uh, from a lifetime of poor diet so we're going to be falling off with uh, an in inadequate bone structure mm -hmm. sure and you've mentioned calcium and vitamin d and just how important do you believe that having adequate levels of both these nutrients is in order to prevent and treat bone injuries i think they're both really important um we know that the vast majority of people living in northern latitudes um, you know, like, you know, where I am in the UK, in the winter months will be vitamin D deficient. Um, we know that vitamin D, despite being in some foods such as shiitake mushrooms, um, isn't in foods in sufficient quantities that in the winter months you can really correct or you can really get enough vitamin D on board. Uh, and the huge role that vitamin D has in bone formation and bone health So I think vitamin D is, is crucial, and it's one thing that I would be as an athlete getting checked um, and making sure that, you know, at 25 OHD concentration was at least 75 nanomoles per liter throughout the year. Uh, and then calcium as well is, you know, absolutely, as we all know, crucial in bone health. Um, I, I worry with the growing trend for people avoiding foods like dairy, Um You know, and switching to other milks, which unless fortified with calcium can be, you know, c can actually cause a substantial reduction in someone's calcium intake. And then the other factor with calcium, which I'm becoming more interested in, is the uh, dermal loss of calcium. So during exercise, you know, we don't lose a lot in sweat, but we lose a little bit. And there was a really nice study by Louise Burke a few years ago now, where she showed that giving I think I'm right in saying it was 1,200 milligrams of calcium in food or a gram of calcium in a supplement an hour before exercise actually reduced the markers of bone turnover during my exercise session, which could well have been down to the, the dermal calcium loss during exercise. Um, so actually, if what we're getting is increased markers of bone turnover during exercise and we can prevent it by timing calcium around exercise, we may have a strategy that, there that we can use long term, which will maintain a better standard of bone health, which then may help us if we do come off a bike to prevent a fracture. Yeah, no, terrific message, uh, Graham, to leave our listeners with regarding milk and dairy phobia. And we've had here on the podcast Dr. Lewis James from Loughborough University to talk about the importance of milk and dairy uh, in the recovery process. But here we are highlighting its role as a calcium provider for those who tolerate it, of course. And uh, sorry for the off topic uh, here. Uh, please bear with me uh, because I think this... Uh, we are still inside this mist of milk avoidance and I feel that somehow we just go so easily for the plant-based alternatives thinking they are uh, the same or better and we've stopped considering milk and dairy and it's not about one food versus another uh, this is not about putting milk on the pedestal and but we've stopped considering milk in some sports contexts and yes I believe it may be essential to include uh, to include it in the cyclist's diet as well so Uh, looking for at the supplements with a possible role in tendon and ligament 
repair. Um, it, it's almost impossible to cover all of them here in detail. So unless you, uh, you yeah. wish to refer another uh, another supplement that you wish that you consider to to be worth, uh, Graham, please go ahead. Otherwise, I would like to focus our attention on, on collagen supplementation, which uh, nowadays appears to be uh, skyrocketing in popularity among athletes uh, and cyclists. I would uh, I would say that. It's- uh, yeah, I think that's probably been the most um, exciting addition to the, the sport nutrition world over the last few years. Um, the work of Keith Barr on, on collagen uh, or gelatin, um, from a, a tendon ligament and, and even a bone perspective in terms of you know joint pain so yes I, I think that's a good uh, you know a good one to focus upon great so what's your take here on the possible role of collagen in the prevention and treatment of certain injuries in cyclists or any athlete for that matter yeah so you know we know about the structure of uh, of, of collagen um and we know that like basically you know, collagen structure is just repeating uh, tripeptides of glycine, uh, any other amino acid, and then proline, hydroxyproline. So um, the theory being is that if you can increase your glycine uh, and proline, hydroxyproline, then you've got the potential to increase collagen formation, uh, which then has effects on ligaments, tendons, etc. Um so Keith Burr has been looking at this uh, and is developing quite a nice evidence base as shown that both in engineered ligaments, uh, in vitro, and even in whole body studies, that there, there is evidence that providing um, these collagen peptides can have uh, you know, beneficial effects. There's, there's a couple of things to uh, caveats and in, important considerations to, to consider here. Um, one of them being is that the, the collagen needs to have vitamin C available at the same time, or you know, the collagen supplementation doesn't need to be a huge amount of vitamin C, just you know, around about fifty milligrams of vitamin C. And actually, um, some people have started to make collagen jellies by you know boiling um, standard collagen gelatin that you can buy in the shops with vitamin C and making little jellied sweets. However, that approach can actually damage the vitamin c so actually you don't get the same response so you can't boil it if you're going to add the vitamin c to it the other thing to think about is that the timing of this becomes really important so the way that keith likes to describe it is that it's not easy to get these um, collagen peptides in into the ligaments and tendons it's not like muscle whereby if you were to take a regular protein supplement you know, it will get into the muscle. Um, so the way I've heard Keith describe it is if you think about a sponge, when it contracts, and if it contracts near water, when you release that sponge, that action will suck the liquid into the sponge. Uh, so he says the same about ligaments and tendons uh, and the collagen. So it's important that the timing of it is right, around about 30 minutes before you do some uh, some contractions of that ligament or tendon that we're looking to get the collagen into but the final caveat i would add here is that my understanding is that this is never the collagen has never been fully compared with other proteins so there still is the chance that regular protein you know or other proteins may be beneficial um although the theory here is that you know the collagen um is really high in glycine and hydroxyproline and proline so actually there's a good rationale for why this would be the optimal type of protein to to help in in this regard. Yes, and that is the point I was aiming for after your answer, because we've had here Dr. Stuart Phillips here on the podcast uh, talking about this as well, and we were discussing that the rationale here would be that we ingest collagen, we absorb it and its amino acids, and in some way, these amino acids are incorporated in our own collagen matrix, and you've mentioned this issue as well. Uh, If this is the case, wouldn't this happen by ingesting any other protein powder? You know, it could well be, and let's say I'm really excited to see that study being done. The theory would be that um, the, it's the amount of uh, glycine, proline, hydroxyproline that you would you would uh, release from the digestion of the collagen compared with the digestion of, of, of whey protein. Uh, to be honest, there's lots of questions like this. You know, it's a similar question with regards to you know the work that has shown casein protein being ta- taken late at night. 
is advantageous to feed the muscle overnight. But again, them studies have always been compared with a placebo or with nothing compared with, you know, not being compared with weight. Um, so there is more to be done in that field. Um, however, you know, at the moment there is some good evidence by one of the most respected sports scientists in the world, you know, in Keith Barr, that, that has shown that there is the benefit there. And then anecdotally, you know, we have used this with some of the with the athletes who have reported uh, favourable effects on joint pain, etc. So, um, whilst there are definitely more questions to answer um, at the moment, it, this is one approach I'm willing to uh, give a go until any strong evidence proves otherwise. Terrific. Looking forward to see that research as well. So starting to wrap up here, what take-home messages could you leave us with regarding this topic, especially things that we can actually control and that you consider we should focus our attention on when dealing with injuries and establishing nutritional recommendations for these athletes? I guess my take-home is like everything in life is that prevention is better than cure. We need to optimize our diet to give ourselves the very best chance that these injuries don't happen. And I think specifically from a cycling perspective, it's the energy availability. Um, it's looking at potentially a calcium-rich pre-exercise meal, which could help with uh, dermal calcium loss and increased markers of bone turnover. It's looking at vitamin D, but also looking at the, you know, the whole diet in general. If we are to... Um, be in a state of low energy availability, there's a good chance that we're going to be deficient in a variety of vitamins and minerals that have important uh, roles in injury and injury prevention. So, you know, I think it, the take-home message is it's not just your diet isn't just fuel from the bike. You know, the diet is actually really important for a variety of, of health-related reasons and, and seeking qualified professional advice to make sure that using a food first approach that we're not just focusing on supplements we're focusing on a good overall diet can have massive effects and reduce our chance of getting injured I'll make sure to put a, a clapping sound effect after your answer, Graham, because I think that's a, a great final message to and balanced message to leave our listeners with uh, regarding all the things that we've been discussing so far. And I think we've covered a lot of important information here. So, and what research in this topic would you like to see in the next 10 years? Uh, I, I think in this topic, the biggest answer has got to be the energy availability things. You know, it's no use saying to an athlete or particularly to a rider when they see the elite athletes doing so well by being lean to eat more because we're just going to ignore you. So what we need to work out is what are the cutoffs? Uh, if you are going to do some training with low energy availability, what can we do to prevent any negative effects um, and really get a good grip of of this relative energy deficiency in sport. But I think this, from an endurance perspective, is the key question that we need to answer in the next decade. Okay, Graham, I think we are uh, done here. I think this has been great and we have a lot of important information to uh, to provide our listeners with. If people want to uh, keep in touch with you, with your, um, with your updates, with your interactions on social media, where can people go to? Yeah, I'm afraid I spend a little bit too much time on social media, so um, I can easily be found on Twitter at close underscore nutrition or on Instagram, close nutrition, all one word. Um, and actually, I do have my own website now, www.closenutrition.com, uh, or I can be found on the Liverpool John Moores University website. So actually, I'm quite easy to find. I will provide the links that you've just provided on the episode show notes on fueldapedal.com. And Graham, this has been great. I can only thank you for your time, for taking the time to do this and hope to talk to you soon. No problem at all. And thanks for the invitation. And there you go, episode 19 and the first episode of 2020. 
Dr. Graham Close provided us with really incredible and balanced insights to consider when dealing with injured cyclists and athletes in a general way. I truly hope you've liked this episode and more is yet to come in the following months. So stay tuned, guys. Thank you for listening and I'll talk to you very soon on Fill the Pedal Podcast.